It's on the. I've been with Oak North uh, since um, April 2016, so pretty much at the start of uh, Oak North's journey. And I've had the pleasure and delight of working with some fantastic clients. And one of our key clients that we onboarded through the pandemic was Sorinda. Um, and I'll just pass it on to Sorinda for a brief intro, then I'll lead into the Q&A. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Mohit. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so Aurora Group, or we, I think, uh, like Hannah mentioned, that we started in 99. Uh, we now have 16 hotels, of which we operate 12 ourselves, just over six and a half thousand bedrooms. That's one part of the business. The second part of the business is our construction arm, Grove Developments, and we don't do any external construction projects. We only do our own in-house, whether we're building a new hotel or new office building or refurbing anything. So our own team take care of that side. And lastly, our real estate portfolio, so the property arm and uh, three MDs that look after the three businesses and uh, myself and Sanjay, my son, who's in the business now for six years plus, um, are delighted to be working with all our team members. Fantastic. Thank you, Surinder. So look, I've been very fortunate to, you know, have known, worked with you for a number of years and so forth. The group has had a, you know, a fascinating journey from when you, where you began, where you are today. Um, you know, from 1999, from your first hotel. I think it's it'll be interesting to give other members, other people on the webinar, a flavour of you know how your the step, the relevant steps in your journey, and how you come to come from one hotel in 99 to where you are today, and actually how your business model has evolved through that time period. Because we saw in for those who remember in 2000, you had the dot com crash or boom and crash You've, we've had the gfc we've now had covid um, and we're also now facing macro pressures with interest rates inflation and geopolitical risk so you know how has the business not only evolved but grown even stronger through adversity and continues to have a very stable platform so it'd be, it'd be great if you can walk us through the journey and your thought process and, and how do you keep on pivoting and, get, and keep getting better I think I've always said uh, more in life that uh, life is like a wave. We get ups and downs. Um, it's never a straight line um, upwards. And um, so we did open the first hotel in 99, which was dedicated for British Airways cruise. We then built a second one. And then we were building the third one in Crawley Gatwick. And that hotel uh, we thought was all pre-let to British Airways and American Airlines. And literally eight weeks before we opened the hotel, 9-11 happened. So the whole world was collapsing around us. The contract we had with the airlines, both the airlines with BA and with uh, American, was that we will guarantee to give you all our business. What they did not guarantee was the number of rooms. So originally, when we started building that hotel, it was both the airlines requirement was something like 150 rooms each per night. So that was literally my hotel sold. Oh, that's at least what we planned that was going to happen. And then weeks before the opening, 9-11 and BA and American Airlines, their numbers dropped. They literally stopped more or less in Gatwick. And the numbers fell from 150 each airline to 28 to 30 each airline. So that was a big struggle. There was a big, obviously, um, I wouldn't say alarm bells with the lenders, with the bankers, but of course there are stakeholders and that was a big issue. Uh, we worked very hard. We then decided to obviously go after other carriers, other airlines, including the likes of Northwest, Delta, United. Uh, they were staying in a lot of hotels in Brighton area and we managed to convince some of them to come to us in Crawley. Um, and we also changed our business model very quickly instead of having just air crews that we went down the corporate leisure route so we then now moved from airline to um, sort of a normal hotel type business and uh, thereafter um, you know we've had other uh, in our journey uh, you know you had the financial crisis we had seven seven 
Um, we had um, obviously the, the COVID recently. Uh, so it's always just changing with the times. And uh, I guess uh, I've always said, look, you know, we need to think outside the box. Uh, how do we uh, change? How do we change with the times, with the market? Um, so as an example, uh, at Heathrow, for example, uh, if we have uh, mass disruptions, and when I talk about mass disruptions, um, you know, when we had the Icelandic ash cloud a few years ago, if you remember, flights, the whole world literally, or certainly over Europe, they stopped flying any air, air, aircraft, and people were booking cabs from Heathrow to Madrid and Paris and so on. So or when you have snow, when you have other disruptions, um, a few years back, a good few years back, when there was that uh, 777 that uh, crash landed on the southern runway, and that blocked the runway, uh, not just for a few hours, but for a little while. And that way, the capacity of the airport reduces by whatever percentage, and the people coming in or going out can't go anywhere. So, And then it's down to the airline's responsibility to put them up. And I remember in the olden days, Mohit, I recall uh, there was um, disruption at Heathrow, I think it was lack due to weather. And then the airline will put the passengers in all the hotels they can get spaces in. And they'll go as far as Brighton, Reading, Newbury, Oxford, Birmingham, and all the hotels were packed. And then I remember in one of those incidents where British Airways actually literally flew over 200 of their passengers to a hotel in Glasgow. So they put them on an aircraft, flew up to Glasgow for the night, and next day bring them down. And I thought, well, actually, we could do something different here. So, um, and then a lot of passengers that stuck in the airport had to sleep on the floor in the terminal. So I said to British Airways uh, and the airport, and I said, I have an idea. We have a conference uh, banquet hall, uh, which is good for over a thousand people. Why don't we get some sleeping bags and actually, instead of people sleeping on the floor in the terminal, we'll take care of them in a warm place, in a, in a sleeping bag, and they can have hot meals. We can use our spa that they can shower. And the initial reaction from the airlines was, you're having a laugh surrender. We're not going to put people in sleeping bags in your hospital. Well, after the first incident, they started using us. And now over the years, if ever, God forbid, there's a mass disruption, uh, they'll actually give you a voucher for a sleeping bag in the hospital. And we then give those, uh, we'll wash them and either the passengers can take the sleeping bags or we'll give them to charity. Um, when we had the COVID recently, uh, and in the past, we've done park and fly. If you're familiar with flying out of the airport, a lot of people going on holidays will um, book their car for a week and uh, they'll, they'll stay a night at the hotel and go off on their holidays. So that's called park and fly. And we started when the government came up with the idea of having these COVID tests. And we said, why don't we come up with... Uh, test, rest and fly. So for a price, very competitively priced, uh, people can come and book a night at the Sofitel, check in, have the COVID test, stay the night over, and in the morning, before they wake up for breakfast, they have the, uh, the, the result on their phones. So that again gave us a, a lot of extra business that perhaps maybe we wouldn't have had so it's always thinking outside the box and trying to do something a little bit different. That, that leads on nicely to my next question regarding, as your business model has evolved from 99 when you had the first hotel, which was underpinned by the contract with British Airways, how has your, your thoughts on funding and funding partners changed as you've gone through a journey? And obviously you've been through some interesting journeys with some interesting partners along the way. It'd be, it'd be great to get your view on what you think of, what well, your thought process is generally on the, on, your fun, on the funding partners that you've had to date and the, the new ones you've onboarded relatively recently. 
and also about how funders have treated you through the cycles that you've that you've been through and the learnings there for the market in general so Mohit, I, I have always been a farmer in business never a hunter i don't really look for a quick kill or a few basis points cheaper or expensive if i disagree i'll always have an arm wrestle with my partners so i started off and uh, there's no secrets about this uh, my first ever lender i dealt with was allied irish bank and they were kind of my local banker I'd been working with from my first hotel to uh, until about 2012. Um, and then obviously as the business was getting bigger, I needed more than one lender. So AIB were my first lender, then RBS, then Santander, Bank of Ireland and so on. And really, I think if you have long relationships and we also have to, and one of the things I guess I didn't understand myself in the early days, which was if I'm going to borrow tens of millions from my lenders, I also have to look at them as my stakeholders, uh, as my partners. Um, uh, you know, when I talk about partners, not actually partners in the business, but they're my partners in the family environment. And um, I, so I've always kind of said in life, you can only clap with two hands. And, you know, I need to deliver to my lenders what we promise. And that's why I'd rather under promise and over deliver than over promise and under deliver. Because it's again, if you're looking at it on a long term basis, it's really there should be no uh, hidden agendas. And um, so that's the way I've always worked. So I started, obviously, I was dealing with all these different lenders. And then after the financial crisis in 2012, I think when Allied Irish came, came to us and said, look, we're going to sell your debt which was a complete shock. They wanted to get out, uh, but later on we found out that they were practically bust themselves as a lender back in Ireland. And obviously from there, they, they had their own issues, but that did really, when I say disappoint me, upset me, hurt me. Guys, I've been with you from day one. And now when I need you, you're gonna kind of dump me. Uh, anyway, we move on in, in on the other side, um, I also had Bank of Ireland, uh, who we started dealing with just before the financial crisis in 2008. And they stuck with us right the way through. And they said, Surinder, if we lend you 100p in the pound, we know we're going to get 100p back. We're very happy to support you and be with you. So all I would say to any of your listeners, Mohit, that uh, if you really want to, in my world, uh, not just be successful, but have those happy relationships. It's give and take. Sometimes a few basis point uh, isn't the only thing uh, in a deal. Uh, and I'll come to that in a minute with my relationship with Oak North. And I have not been paid to say this. Uh, I'm not getting um, uh, any, uh, I'm not looking for any uh, expectations there at all on a cheaper deal next time or whatever we do with Mohit and the team. But it was really, uh, if I work with my lenders and if we promise and deliver what we promise, then I expect the lenders to help and promise us, uh, obviously, through the ups and downs in life. So it, it, it's been, uh, I guess, a journey from my side, Mohit, that uh, we're very blessed. We've got great relationship with all our lenders. I've stuck to same lawyers. I've stuck to same my tax KPMG guys from day one. So I think long-term relationships do pay off. And that's why I would never really change and chop for the sake of a few pennies. Brilliant, thank you for that. Um, just going back to the pandemic now, when was the moment for you, you realized how serious it, it was gonna become? And in particular, when did you start thinking, given your exposure to the travel industry, given the world had pretty much stopped, that what were you going to do how are you how are you going to deal with it and how do you think your the foundations that you laid especially from a, uh, a financial structure perspective you alluded to a bit earlier about how lowly geared you were has helped you see you through that that tough period especially through lockdowns but also essentially help you reposition and take advantage of some of the growth opportunities out there in the market 
Yeah, so look, life is always at risk and reward. And uh, I've, I've always been, uh, I, I, I've never been a strategist. I've always been an opportunist. Um, but even then, I'll only take calculated risks. Um, I'll never want to be taking a risk and jump from the fourth or fifth floor. I might be happy to uh, risk and reward and jump from the first floor because I know the likelihood is I can walk away with a broken arm or broken leg, but I'll survive at least. The only thing I would say to your listeners is that, you know, we all make mistakes in life. Uh, back in 2008 crisis, we were heavily geared. We were, in the eyes of my financial, um, my finance director, I was probably over leverage, over gear, over trading. And in life, we can all make mistakes. But I think the golden rule is make mistakes, but just never repeat them. Make new ones and keep learning. So I made a promise to myself back in 2008, nine, that, you know, we're going through this horrible journey. I never want to go through this again. And how do we over the coming years work hard and de-gear and touch wood, that's exactly what we did. So we, we de-geared, we were obviously okay. Um, and obviously when the, um, the COVID hit, uh, no one knew. Originally, I remember uh, in March, uh, 2020, uh, reforecasting our budgets, our numbers, and saying, oh, we think we'll be okay by September. We think the world will come back. So we re did our reforecasting and thinking, well, from November, uh, September, we'll be back to 70, 80% and so on. So we, we kept doing that literally every quarter more hit. And the sadly, the pandemic and COVID and the crisis, just, you know, everything just kept getting pushed back. But thank God we were okay in a sense that we actually expedited our refurbishment of the Sofitel Gatwick, uh, as well as the Hilton and Gatwick, we were doing that, um, as well as building our Fairmont at Windsor. So we actually used that time when we didn't have the business uh, to go through and say, well, can we actually uh, bring these properties back in uh, rather than having to shut down part or all of the properties in the normal world. So if there is no business, then we might as well just um, do something else that would benefit us, benefit us in the long term. And if that makes sense. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's excellent. And then what, what lessons, what do you think the key lessons that you've learned and you could say for people listening in that you've learned and implemented through COVID and going forward? I, I think in whatever you do in life, uh, whether it's COVID or financial crisis, you've always got to believe in yourself. You know, if you lose that um, self-belief, um, then it just really gets more tougher. The hill is getting steeper and steeper. So you always believe in yourself. Um, I'd always say that in life, it's easy said than done, but never really over, uh, over leverage yourself or over gear or over trade. I learned that through my mistakes. Uh, and again, um, Sanjay and the family and the, the rest of the team are fully aware that that's one thing that we never want to do in our business to put a risk what we've built so far. Uh, and finally, of course, never ever give up. Um, you know, the, the world changes, the, the markets change, just as you at Oak North, the way you have come in. And when I say either disruptor or being different from other lenders, Mohit, uh, I mean, you yourself used to work for one of the big high street banks. And the way Oak North deal um, is so different. I was giving that example to one of the large, uh, big four bank CEO only two weeks ago. And I was telling him how different the experience, the customer experience that I experienced with Oak North. Because when we first met Mohit yourself and Rishi, uh, I think it was at the Asian Business Awards. And uh, we then met after that and we saw you and thought, oh, maybe you could do business one day. And when I heard your rates and your uh, deal, and I said, oh, no, no, we don't want to pay that. We don't want to do that. But my mindset changed over the coming two or three years 
Uh, one, you never gave up. You know, you're always there. You never pushed us to do any business. But then when we felt when well, we had an opportunity to do something, and if it's a question of me paying a little bit more margins, but I can do a deal where I can make uh, decent money, well, I'll be mad not to do that. We all obviously have our own requirements. And then to be honest with you, I was blown away, always have been, uh, your credit process and the way you dealt uh, was something exceptional, which I've not seen with any other lender before or since. And I think that they are, in my view, uh, that they're actually missing an opportunity, not m changing with the times. Uh, and that's something that Oak North, you definitely have got more than right. Um, you know, we all have to, you need to make sure that when you lend your money, you're going to get your money back from the client, from, you know, your money safe and secure. You need to make sure that your investors' money with you is safe, that you're not just giving out cash and never getting it back. And the, the, the clients also need to feel important and make sure that they, if you promise something that you're going to deliver as well. Um, and I think not just that, um, I was actually talking to someone this morning and they rang me and they said, oh, we were going to do the deal and all our refi and everything else. We thought it was going to be done by March. And it's one of the high street bankers. I won't name them. Uh, but now we've been told it's going to go to the end of June. So it's delayed by three or four months. It's just the time is taken. And when my team were dealing with your team, uh, not internally, but externally lawyers and everything else, I think that experience was very much a positive experience. Let's work together. You need to take the right securities. We want to make sure we pay a reasonable, not get ripped off by lawyers or other advisors. And uh, I think it was a great, uh, you know, and I, I certainly, from my point of view, uh, it's been a great experience. Thank you. That, that's that's very kind of you. Let, let's be clear. We don't want the high street lenders to change the way they are currently. I think they should continue <laughs> their archaic, archaic ways and uh, put the customer second because that definitely helps us. Um, but that, look, that, that, that's very kind of you. Just just looking forward now to where the business is today, where you're looking at tomorrow, and actually then where, where you're thinking of the business in, say, three to five years, because the world's changed forever in the way we do things, the way we look at it, the embracement of technology and so forth. How do you now, Surinder, position the Aurora Group? Because, you know, like I said, from, a, from, from one... From one hotel in 99 to a multi-billion pound group, from a, someone who come from, came from Punjab in the 70s with nothing, just a jacket on your back, didn't know the language and have built an empire and a legacy. Where do you take that now going forward? Well, I, I think, again, just doing it step by step, Mohit, uh, Sanjay has been in the business for six years and he's got uh, slightly different views to his father. And I think that's a good thing. You can't just carry on doing the same forever. Uh, I've obviously, uh, when he came in and said that, you know, we need to do, maybe make sure that we diversify a little bit. Um, you know, originally we did properties and developments and hotels, but now we're diversifying into other things as well. I mean, I think he's on his third care home deal. And I think it's just really looking, the only difference with, with myself and I think that would be different to Sanjay as well. He's probably a little bit, he's an entrepreneur, but he's a bit more of a uh, strategist than I am. I've just always been an opportunist that if I see a deal, can I make the numbers work? And for me, that deal could be anything. And uh, I guess the next three, five years is just continuing to make sure that we're working on solid footings, solid foundations, you know, even during the pandemic, we have acquired three or four assets um, because there's always opportunities in life. And I think uh, uh, coming, getting forward, I, I, I don't think it's going to be, um, what's the right word? It's not going to be uh, so kind of easy, but then also there'll be lots of opportunities. Uh, and, uh, you know, all I say to any of your clients, listeners, friends, I've always said that in life, so in the, you know, and I've tried to teach my kids the same way, you know, let's make sure that you are climbing the steps, the ladder, and one step 
ahead and one behind. Uh, a step behind, you never forget your past. And step ahead, you always remain ambitious. But don't sit there or stand there and look at the sky because you'll uh, you'll hurt your neck. So doing it step by step, doing it slowly uh, will pay off in my view. Fantastic. And my, my, my final question to you, look, there's lots of hoteliers and hospitality folk on this call. W what advice would you give them around funding and their growth strategies? And what are the sort of key lessons that you learn, pitfalls? And, you know, what's worked really well for you to grow your business going forward? Well, I, 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 in some people after the pandemic have said, oh, the hotel business is dead and buried or, uh, you know, we don't think it's going to be like before. Uh, I, I think it's, you know, the hotel business will always be there. I think you know, all you've got to do is make sure that whatever one does, uh, location, location, location is always very important. Um, but making sure that you get the right property in the right place um, you know, I, I, I don't know if any of your listeners will know this, but I was offered a property 15 years ago, as you come out of Southall into Hayes, it used to be the old tax office, and it then became a Hyatt Hotel. And when it was first built, and I said, why the hell? And they said, oh, it's Hyatt Heathrow. But it's like 15, 20 minutes away. Why would you put a Hyatt up there? If I was going to do it, it would have been a Premier Inn or a travel lodge. or So it's just making sure the right property in the right place and location is always important. And, you know, I, I love the hotel business. I love the property business, but the people business is not getting t uh, easier, Mohit, at the moment, uh, especially now after COVID. We can't get the staff, uh, the cost, the utilities, uh, the labor cost, everything. But you know, those are little challenges in life. If life was so easy and simple, we'll all be sitting there and doing it. So if you're a business owner, if you're an entrepreneur, if you know, you've got to look at the pros and cons, uh, but just weigh up and make sure, you know, whenever we do something in the earlier days, uh, Sandy would come up and say, oh, Dad, we should look at this in the margin. And I'll then sit there and explain and say why I don't think the margins are enough for error. So. You know, if I was looking at property, for example, I mean, th there's definitely uh, some stresses to come in a sense, you know, with mortgages, interest rates, loans. So you've always got, to, of course, it can go up by 20, 30, 50 percent, but it can also go down by 20, 30 percent. So just basically going in there with your eyes open um, I, I, is, is my uh, always thought that we should keep uh, our eyes open. Fantastic. Uh, Surinder, thank you very much for that.